Welcome back, everyone. And now we're going to begin our study of Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra with Chapter 1. In Chapter 1, we are essentially introduced to uh, the mythological aspects of this work. Um, we know that we are reading or made privy to a discussion between the sage Parashara um, and Maitreya. So this is essentially um, showing us a discourse between a teacher and a student. And the text begins uh, with an opening prayer or an opening, opening offering. I prostrate before the lotus feet of Lord Vigneshwara, the offspring of Uma, the cause of destruction of sorrow, who is served by the Bhuttaganas, or the five great elements of the universe who has the face of a tusker, and who consumes the essence of kapita and jambu fruits. So that's the opening. Chapter 1 is entitled, The Creation. In verses 1 through 4, Offering his obeisance to all-knowing sage Parashra, and with folded hands, Maitreya said, O Venerable, astrology, the supreme limb of the Vedas, has three divisions. These are Hora, Ganita, Samhita. Among the said three divisions, Hora, or the gene theliac part of astrology, is still more excellent. I desire to know of its glorious aspects from you. Be pleased to tell me how this universe is created. How does it end? What is the relationship of the animals born on this earth with the heavenly bodies? Please speak elaborately. In verses 5 through 8, Parashara answered, O Brahman, your question and the desire to know the depth and breadth of astrology has an auspicious purpose that will benefit the welfare of the universe. Praying to the Lord Brahma and Sri Saraswati, his power and consort, and to the sun god, the leader of the planets and cause of creation. I shall narrate to you the science of astrology as heard from Lord Brahma. Only good will flow from the teaching of this science when the students are peacefully disposed, honor their preceptors and elders, who practice the truth and have the capacity to experience the awe of God, A-W-E, the awe of God. Woeful will it be to share with the unwilling student, the heterodox, or the person desiring to use the sacred science for crafty purposes. So here we see um, that good flows from this teaching, this science, towards students who are peacefully disposed. Peacefully disposed. Another reason why the practice of meditation and yoga can be very helpful for someone studying astrology, because that will most definitely help you experience inner peace and when you're peacefully disposed, you have greater capacity for clarity, evenness, balance of mind, higher understanding. Honor their preceptors and elders. Now, that makes sense. If you're learning from someone, um, usually it's best to take the approach that this person is successful in that area of life, that field. So, I'm going to listen to what they say. And, you know, too often what comes up is that you know, we get a really feisty student who they have to know everything right now. And so by honoring the preceptors and the elders, that's kind of trusting that they might have a, a methodology uh, to teach you well, even though you don't understand it um, all of the sudden, all at once. Now, of course, you have to find a good teacher first. And that's hard to do because many people who teach um, can be very distracted or confusing or talking in circles or not make a whole lot of sense, but they've got charisma and it makes it seem like they're saying something intelligent. So finding someone in that regard is um, necessary. Uh, those who practice the truth. Now why is practicing the truth important? Again, this takes us back to the system of yoga, where one of the prime practices uh, within the yamas and the niyamas is truthfulness. And that's not simply you know, having to tell the truth all the time about everything, because you, know, you don't want to hurt people's feelings. You know, that's not the kind of truth we're talking about. We're talking about being truthful with who you are. 
learning to embody the truth and that might in, definitely requires that you you learn to tell the truth because the more often you speak the truth and you don't speak the untruth you learn to feel what truth is like because there's a feeling state involved with it in the same way that when you tell a lie to someone if you're a truthful person and you try to tell a lie to someone it doesn't feel good now if you've just been surrounded by lies like your family is full of liars and your friends are all liars well that just feels natural so you might not know the difference until you practice the truth for a little bit but the more you do, the harder it becomes to, um, to tell a lie, to be untruthful with yourself. And truth also means that um, like if you don't want to be in an environment or a situation, you, really, you, move, you remove yourself from it. Because if someone asks you to do something and you can't wholeheartedly be there for them, well, you're not being truthful. Right? So it doesn't mean be lazy, it doesn't mean avoid responsibilities, it just means when you think about it, you've got you to gotta maintain that state of inner truth. And why is that important to learn astrology and to be an astrologer? Because if you have that, then when you're contemplating these texts, you will recognize the truth when you see it. Or when you hear a teacher say something, you will recognize the truth when you hear it. You might not understand it immediately, but you will recognize it. And then you can work it out. You can figure out what it means. Um, when you're doing a reading for someone or, or reading someone's chart, and you're, you're looking at a planetary combination, and you're getting ready to say, oh, this is what you're going to experience. But the moment you start to say that, you start to feel that sinking feeling, like as though you're going to tell a lie, you know, to pay attention and to stop. Because it's not going to be true. So part of the whole idea of practicing the truth, it's moral, sure, but it's because when you practice the truth, it will make it much harder for you to do bad astrology. <laughs> right? Because you can't do bad astrology, because you can't, you can't tell a lie. And I, I hope this makes sense to you. This is something that, you know, has taken years of contemplation for me to figure out why that, why that's so. And I read that a long time ago. Uh, I believe it was an old astrological magazine where this uh, elder astrologer from India, he was in his 80s, was giving an interview. And someone asked him, what is the most important thing that you would tell anyone wanting to learn to practice astrology? And his answer was, always tell the truth. And it's for this very reason, okay? So even if you don't always tell the truth or can't tell the truth, at least start paying attention to how you feel internally when you aren't truthful or when you are truthful, because that will give you an understanding of this feeling of truth so that you can actually recognize it. That's the important thing, to be able to recognize truth. And by practicing truth, allows you to recognize truth. And have the capacity to experience the all, A-W-E, of God. Now, um... Most people interpret that as the fear of God. You know, that's also a very biblical thing, too. But personally, I don't think the idea of fear is appropriate. Fear means you're cowering because someone's going to beat you or something of that nature. You know, there's a very similar feeling when you are overwhelmed by the immensity of how amazing something is. That, that is, can feel like fear. And many people shy away from it because it is fearful. It's almost like you lose yourself in the perception of the wholeness of the universe, of the world, of God, whatever you want to call it. So to be able to have the capacity to experience the awe, A-W-E, of God is most important because the more you study astrology, the more in awe you are actually going to be of everything, the cosmos, how it all makes sense, the harmony within it, the less you're going to realize you know, and you're going to realize that essentially you as an astrologer, you're just doing your best to interpret that flow of this infinite consciousness through you, that all of God has to come through you, and it might not even, you might not be able to understand it half the time, but you have to follow it, you have to trust it. You have to be able to surrender to that mystery, which is the all of God. It says, woeful will it be to share with the unwilling student. What is the unwilling student? Well, think about it this way. You have a love for astrology. You think it's great. Now you want to go out and tell all of your friends about astrology, you know, in the same way that the the person who gets saved religiously. Now he wants to go tell everybody about how he got saved. Well, that's sharing it with an unwilling person. They don't, you know, don't share it with someone who doesn't care, essentially. Um, the heterodox, or the person desiring to use the sacred science for crafty purposes. Well, what are crafty purposes? To manipulate people. Essentially, that's it. Um, you know, you have astrology, so now you know how to read someone's chart to manipulate a partner or to manipulate um, people to get what you want. So anyone who's going to use it for that purpose, um, that's not appropriate. 
And in my mind, that's also manipulating life and trying to get God to do what you want, right? And a lot of people want that. They come to astrology because um, they want to kind of sneak around their karma, or they don't want to actually look at what they, the work they need to do to uh, improve upon their situation. And astrology can show you that, but really astrology is just sharing information, remember, but the person still has to do the work once they get the information. It's like you coming to me and saying, um, I want to be an electrical engineer. Well, I can say, all right, well, go get your degree in engineering and then go get a master's degree in whatever it might be in an MBA in business, and you'll be set to be a successful engineer. But that person really just wants the astrologer to all of a sudden wave his hand and say, all you got to do is, you know, spit off that balcony, throw some rice in a fire, and... Um, you know, pray to a certain uh, aspect of divinity uh, so many thousand times, and you're going to get it. Those kinds of things help for certain things. But personally, astrology needs to be addressed as information about the path a person needs to take. And the chart shows how easy or how hard something's going to occur. So if someone wants to be an engineer, and you don't see any combinations for engineering in their chart, then you need to be able to tell them, your chart shows that you have pretty much zero past life experience, theoretically, in engineering. So you've got a lot of work to do to become an engineer. It's going to be hard work. You're not going to understand it. The math is going to be hard, um, the discipline, the logic. But if you want to do that, perfect. You just have to realize how much work it's going to take. So one of the things astrology can tell is how much work in a certain direction is a path going to be for a person. So anyway, anyway this idea of crafty purposes. Um, essentially, that's what it means. You know, many people um, get on a boat that, you know, astrologers shouldn't charge money, and you know, things of this nature. Well, astrology is a profession just like anything else, um, and as long as you're doing your profession well, and you're doing it in the spirit of service, well, I guess if people want to support that, that's up to them. Uh, if they don't, well, <laughs> you can't force them. So. You know, that's always a debate. So if you think that astrology should all be free and astrologers shouldn't charge anything, well, work that out for yourself. Personally, I don't think that's a crafty purpose. I think that's just being logical in the society that we live in. Um, crafty in that regard would be you don't know anything about astrology, and you're trying to tell people you do, and you're taking their money and then just telling them a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't even make sense in the chart. Well, that's a crafty purpose, so you might want to avoid that. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to... Um, the next verses here. Verses 9 through 12. Sri Vishnu, who is the Lord of all matters, who has a pure spirit, who is endowed with the three gunas, even while transcending their grip, who is the author of this universe, who is glorious, who is the cause, and who is endowed with valor, has no beginning. He authored the universe and administers it with a quarter of his power. The other three quarters of him, filled with nectar, are knowable only to the wise and mature contemplatives. So here we see a reference to contemplation as being important. The principal evolver, who is both perceptible and imperceptible as Vasudeva. The imperceptible part of the Lord is endowed with dual powers, while the perceptible with triple powers. Okay, now, in this instance, uh, you may need to do some research on what a guna is, G-U-N-A. Um, I'm not going to go over it here. When we get to the area on gunas within the text, we'll talk about it. But for now, your homework is to figure out what is a guna, G-U-N-A, Google it. Or you can refer to... Um, Let's see, a book I wrote called Kriya Yoga, Continuing the Lineage of Enlightenment. There's a chapter in there on the gunas. And this will be true for any terms that I discuss that you don't understand. It is your homework to research it. You know, I, this is how I learned. You know, reading a lot of these um, Sanskrit terms, reading a lot of these terms that are not really common in uh, the Western world, I had to get out a dictionary. I had to go online. I had to, what are they talking about? <laughs> Um, when I read spiritual texts, even when it comes to some English words, and they say things like the, uh, the um, object and the subject, 
Well, we use that word in certain ways, but in the way that certain texts use it, you might need to figure out what is that definition. So part of becoming a more intelligent person, more intelligent astrologer, is learning how to figure out what these words are that you don't understand, and actually going and looking them up, not just glossing over them. So in this situation, you may need to look up gunas if you don't know what it is. Many of you probably already do. Um, there will be a lot of reference to uh, mythological issues, mythological people within um, this text because it is uh, an East Indian uh, astrological text. So you may need to research that. You know, for example, one of the courses that's available at AshvilleVedicAstrology.com is my favorite course called The Myth and Magic of Vedic Astrology. I think it's one of the longer courses, like 16 or 18 hours, but it goes into each planet and the mythology behind it. So if we get to um, a deity or a term that you don't understand, do some, res do some research on it. Because we, based on the length of this text in and of itself, we're not going to have time to go through each every one of them without doing a comprehensive, um, a comprehensive investigation of you know, Indian mythology. So it's important that you do that. But that's your personal homework. Okay. Now, sutras, or not sutras, pardon me, verses 13 through 15. The three powers are Sri Shakti, or Mother Lakshmi, and this is related to the Sattva Guna, S A T T V A, Sattva Guna. Bhu Shakti, or Mother Earth which is related to Rajas Guna, and Nila Shakti, which is related to Tamas Guna. So what we see is the three powers that we discussed in the previous verse are Sri Shakti, which is Lakshmi, Goddess Lakshmi, Bhu Shakti, which is related to Mother Earth, Nila Shakti, which is related to Tamas Guna, and um, Nila Shakti is often related to Kali, the goddess Kali. So again, you might need to look up Sattva Guna, Rajas Guna, Tamas Guna, and also these mythological names. Apart from the three, the fourth kind of Vishnu, influenced by Sri Shakti and Bhu Shakti, assumes the form of Shankarsana with Tamas Guna, of Pradyumna with Rajas Guna, of and Arudi with Sattva Guna. And these are all forms of Vishnu, forms of God, essentially. So when you research that, that's what you're going to discover. You're going to discover what each one of them represents. Maha Tattva, Ahamkara, and Ahamkara Murti. Brahma are born from Shankarsana, Pradyumna, and Anirudhi, respectively. All these three forms are endowed with all the three gunas, with predominance of the guna to their origin. Now, it's important for you to contemplate this. <clears throat> so go back, re-listen, write it down, figure out what each of these things mean. Mahatattva, that's the essential element. So, um, that which all elements come out of, generally speaking. You'll find out more when you research it. Uh, ahamkara, this is the sense of individualization, you know, like like you are a person, you are an individual person, well you're really not, but you feel that way. So it's the feeling of, of the ego arising. Uh, ahamkara murti, that's the form of the ego. For example, when you look at a statue or you perform worship towards a statue, it's called a murti, which represents the form of that uh, deity that you're worshiping. So they're born from these three principles of God. Um, Sankarsana, Pradyumna and Enirudi, and each of these are related to a guna. So again, this is probably going to be very dry for you, especially if you really want to get in there and just learn how to do astrology. But learning the philosophy, learning the principles that astrology is based upon, contemplating them in time will help you be a better astrologer. We've got a little bit further to go. So Ahamkara is of three classes. So now we're getting into the division of Ahamkara, and there is a school of philosophy called Samkhya philosophy. 
um, which could be important for you to study. You know, many yogis actually do. Again, why I think it's important to uh, study yoga. But anyway, ahamkara is of three classes, and these classes have a sattvic disposition, a rajasic disposition, and a tamasic disposition. So we see that each of these gunas, because those are gunas, are necessary for the creation of the world. So one is not better or worse than the other. They are all necessary. Too often people act like um, one is better than the other, but you need all three of them. You can never not have all three of them. There's the divine class. There are sensory organs. Um, the five primordial elements, these all come from the three ahamkaras, or the three senses of, of individualization, three senses of ego. So the sense organs. We well, you know what the sense organs are, the eyes, the ears, taste, smell. Um, it's not necessarily the physical aspect, but it's the capacity to smell, the capacity to see. The five primordial elements, um, water, earth, air, um, water, earth, air, fire, ether. These all make up the creation. So essentially we're going through a breakdown of what is the creation made of, right? It's helping to condition your mind to understand to think in this uh, metaphysical way. So now we continue. Lord Vishnu coupled with Sri Shakti rules over the three worlds. Coupled with Bhu Shakti, he is Brahma causing the universe. Coupled with Nila Shakti, which as I mentioned is often related to Kali, the goddess Kali, he is Shiva destroying the universe. So here we're starting to see Vishnu or the all, everything. Vishnu is essentially everything. Coupled with Sri Shakti rules over the three worlds. You know, some people say the three worlds are um, the earth, the atmosphere, and the heavens. You can think of it like deep sleep, dreaming, and wakefulness. So the existence within those worlds. And verses 21 through 24. The Lord in all beings and the entire universe is in him. So essentially everything, everyone, the whole universe is in this concept of Vishnu, divine consciousness. All beings contain Jivatma and Paramatma. Amshas. Amsha means a part. Jivatma. Jiva, that's like the little soul, the person, right? So Jiva is individualized consciousness, a personality in a sense. Um, Paramatma, that's connection to the wholeness, knowing that you are an aspect of uh, everything. Paramatma, very much like God consciousness, one with everything. So some have predominance of the former, while yet some have predominance of the latter, which means some beings are more egotistically involved. They are more have more jiva, uh, jiva consciousness, while some predominate in um, paramatma consciousness, which means they are aware of the fact that they are um, not an individual, they are part of a whole. They are divinely connected. You can look at it that way. Um, the idea of the paramatma predominates in the grahas. Graha, that means planet, essentially. Uh, as we're talking about astrology, like the Sun is a Graha, Venus is a Graha, uh, Saturn is a Graha, Rahu is a Graha. So the Grahas, the Paramatma predominates, this connection to the whole predominates. And Brahma and Shiva and others, Paramatma predominates. Their powers or consorts too have predominance of the Paramatma consciousness. Others, such as humans, have more Jivatma, uh, jiva consciousness. So, this is the end of the first chapter in Brihat Parashar Shastra. And in the next chapter, we're going to get into the powers, the gods and the goddesses related to uh, Vedic astrology, or we'll say Parashara, Parashari astrology. And I only say that because the term Vedic was kind of coined in the, uh, I think it was the 80s or the 90s, um, but my concept of Vedic astrology would probably relate more to Vedic times, which, again, from my reading and my understanding, uh, probably 
didn't involve a lot of personal chart analysis. It was more for acting in harmony with the seasons, acting in harmony by sacrifices, by planning spiritual events, by planning, planning events, essentially. So essentially tuning yourself into the most opportune, auspicious time to begin or to do something. That's what I think true Vedic astrology was. Again, that's just my opinion. Um, but as time goes on, it progressed, it became more developed into what we have nowadays, which involves uh, understanding individuals' charts, you know, worldly affairs, uh, predictions, and things of this sort. So, just wanted to clear that up. So this will conclude our section on Chapter 1 of Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra. Take some time to go back and review, to think about it. Uh, hopefully this is of some interest to you. If it's not, well, we'll say that's okay for now, but definitely keep in mind that studying this first chapter, learning what the mythology of the gods and goddesses is spoken of, um, what the gunas are, how they, re how they work, or studying Samkhya philosophy, I can give you a greater understanding, a greater appreciation for what we will be getting into as we go deeper into um, this text.